This purple flower produces the world's most expensive spice, saffron. While it can sell for $10,000 per kilogram, climate change is making it even more expensive. Because of lower than usual rainfall over the last few years, production here in Kashmir has dropped significantly, and fields that once yielded this delicate spice have become sites for new housing construction. Climate change is threatening the production of all kinds of foods, from cloves in India to eels in Japan and Spain. Here are 10 expensive and vulnerable foods and why climate change is making them so much more expensive. Eel is among the most expensive fish in Japan, with baby eels selling for as high as $35,000 a kilogram. Overfishing, pollution, changes to oceanic currents and a decline in habitat have all contributed to this prized fish slowly disappearing, placing it on the IUCN red list of threatened species. But this hasn't stalled the demand. People in Japan have eaten eel for thousands of years. Restaurants like this can sell 40 to 50 tons of eel each year. Japanese eel, or Anguilla japonica, can be found across East Asia. But overfishing and changing habitats have caused a huge decline in eel populations. Since 1980, the global catch of eel has declined by more than 75%, which has had a huge effect on price. Unlike other types of fishing, the majority of eels are raised, not caught as adults. Young eels, called glass eels, are caught in the wild and raised on farms like this. No farms have been able to efficiently breed the eels in captivity, so farmers depend on the catch of young eels to make a profit. Raising this many eels requires constant attention. Michio has been working as an eel farmer for almost 40 years. After the cost of the eels themselves, feeding them is the most expensive part. Two to three times a day, workers feed eels this. It's a mixture of fish meal, wheat, soybean meal, and fish oil. あの、難しいですね。最初はそこから始まりますので、その時期はあの、非常に気を使いますね。もうその一つの池が何か事故とか何かあれば、after six to twelve months of work, eels are big enough to be sold. Workers unload the eels and sort them by size to determine where they'll be sold. Experienced workers can quickly tell the difference just by feel. Some of these eels will end up at restaurants like Serugaya, which has been serving eel for over 150 years. That high demand is part of the reason young eels are so expensive. The final dish is called kabayaki. It may look simple, but preparing it takes years to master. Workers prepare eel live to maintain freshness, but this makes handling much more difficult. 
Workers remove the bones and cut eels to the proper size for the skewers. まあ焼きは一緒まあ一緒ってことは要するに死ぬまでかかるってことですけれども。Eel has to be constantly monitored while it's cooking to achieve even grilling. やはりまあこう硬すぎず柔らかすぎず。Chef steam, then grill each eel three times, dipping it into sauce between each grilling. 実際のまあ食べるこう美味しさ、まあそれを両立させるっていうことが、蓋を開けた時の見栄えが美しい。Kabayaki presented in a lacquer box with rice is called unaju. It can cost up to ninety-one dollars depending on the price of adult eel. If prices are too high, restaurants struggle to make a profit. うなぎの資源量に関しては、やはり我々うなぎ屋さんみんな死活問題ですから、非常にそれは皆さん考えられていると思います。まあ僕も当然そうですし。In Japan, eels are eaten year-round, but consumption peaks in the summer, and it's become a big part of some local economies. But the high demand has caused concern. In 2014, Japanese eels were classified as endangered, and because of low domestic catch, the majority of eels eaten in Japan are imported from China and Taiwan. やはりあの質量量よりも少ないと高騰してくる。高騰してきたときに生産者がどういうふうな利益というをあの。まあそれのバランスをどう取っていくかというのが非常に課題が大きいということになってます今。There have been efforts to improve the eel population, like regulating fishing, releasing adult eels back into the water, and researching how to hatch eels in farms. But the future of Japanese eels remains unclear, and the price is likely to increase with demand. Eels aren't the only pricey seafood at risk of overfishing. Hugu is a deadly pufferfish delicacy served across Japan. The Japanese eat 10,000 tons of this fish every year. In high season, it can cost you $265 per kilo. Overfishing has drastically reduced its population. Despite fishing regulations, certain types of pufferfish are almost completely extinct. There are over 120 species of pufferfish. 22 different kinds are approved by the Japanese government for use in restaurants, but one is more prized and more poisonous than the others: torofugu, or tiger pufferfish. Wild torofugu is often found at high-end restaurants, where it's served as a perfectly thinly sliced sashimi, deep-fried, and even used to make hot sake called hirazake. Yamadai has been serving pufferfish for over 100 years. Their fugu is caught in southern Japan and airlifted alive to their Tokyo restaurants. Sourcing the fish can be tricky. In Heidemari Market, the fugu is auctioned off using a bag and hidden hand signals. Each potential buyer puts their hand in the bag and makes their bid secretly before a successful bidder is chosen. When selling such a dangerous food, safety is paramount. In 2018, when a supermarket accidentally sold five packets of the fish that hadn't had the poisonous liver removed. The town used its missile alert system to warn residents. The tetrodotoxin found in fugu is more toxic than cyanide, and each year about 20 people are poisoned from badly prepared fish. It takes a lot of skill and training to prepare the fish safely and know which parts are poisonous. The poisonous parts can vary by species, and hybrid species are appearing now that are even harder to tell apart. One of the hardest things to distinguish between can be the female fugu's ovaries, which are extremely toxic, and the male's testicles, which are a delicacy. The Japanese government tightly control who can prepare fugu, and chefs need to take an extensive exam before they're legally allowed to serve the fish. This rigorous regulation means that while the fish can be lethal, 
far more people die from eating oysters than fugu each year. ま、all of the skill and training that goes into preparing this fish increases its price. The fish is killed seconds before preparation. And while the process looks gruesome as the muscles continue to spasm, the fish is technically brain dead. <laughs> This method of killing the fish means that the meat stays fresh for longer. And at Yamadaya, the fugu is aged for 24 hours before it's served. So what does it actually taste like? How transparent it is, I didn't particularly expect it to have such a chewy texture. It really is much chewier than I expected, but it's really very subtle taste. It's just a really fresh, sort of clean taste and really, really nice. There's another reason tiger fugu is getting more expensive, overfishing. Tiger pufferfish is near threatened, and in 2005, the Japanese government limited its fishing quotas and seasons. And another popular edible species across Japan, the Chinese pufferfish, has declined in population by 99.9% .9 over the last 45 years. Farmed versions of these fish are much cheaper, and many more affordable chain fugu restaurants are starting to appear. But the farmed version is difficult to raise, and Japanese consumers say it just doesn't taste as good. Wild Fugu's high price guarantees that it's safely prepared by an expert chef. And when you're dealing with a potentially deadly fish, that price is reassuringly expensive. Cashews are another food with a toxic side. Without intensive, precise processing, these nuts wouldn't be edible at all. Harvested just once a year, they grow in select tropical climates, and the change in climate is making them even more vulnerable. Increased rainfall and humidity have greatly affected their quality. Combine that with soaring demand, and prices have gone up. In 2017, the world ate 770,000 metric tons of cashews. They're one of the most popular and valuable nuts in the world worth over $6 billion today. Cashews grow in tropical locations like India, Vietnam, Ivory Coast, and here in Sri Lanka. The trees are a member of the same family as poison ivy. And like poison ivy, cashew plants contain a toxin called urushiol. It's found in the plant itself and the brown oil inside a nut's shell. It can cause burns, itches, and blisters which is why unprocessed cashews are considered dangerous to eat or touch. It's also why they require more rigorous processing than other nuts. Each fruit grows just one shelled nut called a droop, which workers separate by hand. The nuts must then dry under the sun to help draw out some of the shell's caustic liquid. The most difficult and dangerous step is splitting open the nut, since toxic oil still coats the droops. Cashews are brittle, so factories used to do this step manually to ensure machines wouldn't break the nuts. But doing this by hand has frequently raised issues within the industry. 
NGOs have called out some factories for overworking employees and putting workers at risk of burning themselves if they can't afford to buy gloves for protection. Today, machines are advanced enough to crack the shells cleanly, keeping the majority of nuts intact and helping minimize risks to workers. After a machine splits open the shells, the next two crucial stages totally depend on workers who have to do them by hand. The nuts are roasted to ensure, again, that the toxic liquid inside is destroyed. The next stage is particularly tedious, as it relies entirely on handiwork. Workers must peel off the husk, or the dry outer covering that surrounds each nut, because it's high in tannins and could irritate your throat. Removing it is a skill one masters with practice. Experienced workers de-skin only about two and a half kilograms of cashews each night. This step is not only difficult, but also has the biggest impact on price. Cashews are graded by several features, like color, weight, and condition. Large whole nuts are most valuable. Make a miller, Kajuola, Miller Vedimaganatama, Vedima Dega. Ek and it take a tama maker. Make it up again, Pierlicator. And it take a Kaliaker. Samaning and a miller, the Daspan Siena, Pierlio, Rupia Panaka Raduino. A Kaliola, Rupia de Dahak with a Kalibahino. Because cashews can only be harvested once a year. Growers like Laharu save a portion of the nuts in stock so that they can continue making a profit in the months ahead. But it comes at a steep cost. Just stocking the nuts costs Laharu more than $65,000 each year. Kaju 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 this causes prices to fluctuate a bit year round. In December, Laharu's supply has decreased, so prices typically increase. But it also depends on each country's supply chain. While Sri Lanka processes and sells many of its own cashews domestically, other countries export much of what they grow. It's likely that many of the cashews you buy in the US or Europe were grown in Africa, processed in Vietnam or India, and finally exported to the Western market. Africa produces half of the world's supply of cashews. Ivory Coast, for example, produced about 730,000 metric tons of raw cashews in 2019 but it exported over 90% of that. This is because Ivory Coast and other African countries still don't have a robust processing industry. Ivory Coast plans to expand domestic processing by 2024, but without it, cashews are significantly less valuable. In 2018, the export price of cashews processed in India and exported to Europe was 250% higher than the price paid to Ivory Coast farmers. Vietnam, on the other hand, was one of the first countries to invest in automation, making it a key location for processing cashews. Today, Vietnam is the largest cashew exporter in the world. In just the first three months of 2021, the country exported over 108,000 tons of cashews. Automation has also lessened the need to hire workers, which is a reason many factories in India and Sri Lanka still process manually.
by hand or machine. Processing cashews is no easy task. And the world's climate crisis could make it even harder. A 2013 report on the climate's impact on cashews shows unseasonal rains and heavy dew can impact the quality and quantity of the nuts. Just this year, Laharu's harvest came late because of it. Amidst climate challenges, cashews continue to be popular. Healthy eating trends are key to driving demand, along with the versatility of the cashew itself, another reason the nut remains so valuable. Whether used as a snack, cooking paste, or an alternative to milk or butter, cashews have many applications around the world. Researchers predict the market will grow to $7 billion by 2025. And although cashews are currently cheaper than they've been in recent years, demand is likely to drive prices higher in the future. Another food struggling to meet high demand is Salon cinnamon. This elite variety of cinnamon is native to the island country of Sri Lanka, in a region of the world that has been experiencing extreme droughts. Ceylon cinnamon is named after the old British name for Sri Lanka, and it is often considered real cinnamon. It is made from the dried inner bark of a tree called Cinnamomum verum. Growing these trees is an investment. Farmers must wait four years after a tree is planted before they can begin harvesting. At harvest, workers break down the branches early in the morning when the bark is still moist. Ruampora must continuously care for the trees throughout the year. Otherwise, the branches won't be suitable for making cinnamon at all. The rigorous nature of this job has only just begun. Now peelers must do the delicate and essential work of stripping the inner bark of each branch by hand. This is the most labor-intensive part of the process, and it's not as easy as simply shaving the outside of the bark as you would the skin from a potato. To produce the most valuable cinnamon, the bark must be made extremely thin. The thinner the quills are, the more costly they will be. Ruampura has spent 40 years mastering this skill. Soon after the bark is removed, each piece dries under the sun and curls up within a few minutes. After drying, the small pieces are stuffed inside a straight piece of bark, forming one 42-inch quill. By the end of a long day, workers will have only produced about three pounds of quills. Those then need to dry for three to four days before they're packed into bales and sent off to a separate facility. That's where they'll be graded and officially priced based on their wit. P.D. Romanus & Sons buys bales of cinnamon from various peelers. At its facility, quills are graded over 10 scales. The most valuable quills are classified as Alba. It takes a peeler four times longer to produce one kilogram of Alba than to produce the same quantity of lower grades. 
ඕනේ මේක මිලා අධික වෙලා තියෙන ඇත්තටම මේ ඔයගලට පේන මැති මේක පැන්සල් එක ආකාරයෙන් තමයි කියන්නේ කරන්න ඕන. ඒ කියන්නේ කුරුඳු ගහේ පොත්ත ගැලවුවාම පොත්ත අඟලට ඉරීමක්. The leftover smaller cuts are turned into ground cinnamon and make up the cheapest form. But even the most valuable quills are often confused with a more widely accessible and cheaper variety of cinnamon. කුරුඳු වර්ගීකරණය අතර ප්‍රධාන අපේ තරගකාරි කුරුඳු වර්ගයේ ලෙස තියෙන්නේ ඒ චයින වලින් ඒ වගේ ඉන්දුනීසියාවෙන් වියට්නාමෙන් එන කෂියා කුරුඳු එක. Cassia comes from another kind of cinnamon tree called Cinnamomum cassia and it doesn't require as much time or effort to make. Cassia bark is hard and sturdy, so quills are made as one curled piece of bark without the fillings. Ceylon cinnamon on the other hand is tender and soft and needs those inner layers to prevent the quill from breaking. ඒ මොකද මේ පතුරු අර කෂිය කුරුඳු වගේ නිකන් දුන්නොත් ඇත්තටම මේක වටිනාකම නැහැ. මොකද මේක වටිනාකම ආයෙත් තියෙන අපි මේ කූරු වශයෙන් නිෂ්පාදනය කරන නිසා. Cassia is very fragrant and brown, whereas real cinnamon is paler with a milder flavor. Cassia also contains on average higher levels of coumarin, an organic compound that can cause liver damage if consumed in large amounts. This is why researchers say Ceylon cinnamon is ultimately the healthier option. But if you're buying cinnamon in the US, it can be hard to tell the difference between them. Part of the confusion between the two comes from the use of the label cinnamon. In the US, it is legal to label both Ceylon and cassia cinnamon as cinnamon. While in the UK and other countries, cassia must be labeled cassia and cannot be classified simply as cinnamon. Regardless of what it's called in the US, consumers worldwide prefer the real thing. In 2018, Ceylon accounted for more global cinnamon revenue than any other variety. But even as demand is expected to grow through 2025, Climate change poses a serious threat to cinnamon production. In recent years, Sri Lanka has experienced droughts over several months, and these long periods of dry weather can kill cinnamon trees, which need marshy, wet soil to survive. There's also a shortage of cinnamon peelers, another threat to production that's likely to drive up prices. This industry relies on experienced peelers, who can practice the difficult work of making these quills over many years. අනාගතය කියන්නේ දැන් මෙහෙම බල පරම්පරාව මේකට යොමු වෙන්නේ නැහැ. ඒක දැන් අපේ ළමයි වුණක් කැමති නැහැ මේ වතු වලට තාම ඇවිල්ලා දුන්න. දැන් අවුරුදු 18ක් වෙනවා නිකාවකත් ඇවිල්ලා නැහැ. ඒක ඔයගොල්ලෝ කැමති නැහැ මේ වට මෙයා වෙන්නේ. ඉතින් අන්න ඒක තමයි තියෙන මේ අනාගතේ සුබ නැහැ වගේ පේනවා. අද අපිට පුළුවන් කාලෙ ඉතින් අපිට කරද හැකි. ඒක තමයි තියෙන්නේ. In the expensive world of spices, saffron stands out. and it's made rarer by a severe lack of rainfall. Heavy droughts have caused saffron production to drop significantly, as much as 70% in high-supplying areas like Kashmir, where real saffron can cost you over $10,000 a kilogram. It's been sought out for thousands of years as a spice, dye, and medicine, and you need over 150 flowers to make just one gram. Saffron is the red stigma of the crocus sativus. Each crocus has 3 small stigmas that have to be picked carefully by hand. This minuscule harvest means that the amount you get from each flower is roughly 0.006 grams. No machine can do the delicate work required to harvest these thin threads. And it can take 40 hours of hard manual labor to produce just 1 kilogram of high quality saffron. Growing the plants isn't exactly easy either. They they're actually called corms but you know, they're like a bulb basically like a you know a flower bulb. Um so the more flowers per bulb you can get and the bigger the flowers really and that all depends on how you look after it how you grow it the climate. So for example if it rains just before harvest we get bigger flowers if it's very dry just before harvest the flowers are smaller. So you look after the crop during the year by hand and you um pick the flowers by hand and you process the flowers by hand. Once the crop starts flowering, harvesters have to work fast to make sure they can pick it all in time. Almost all of the saffron planted can flower within one week of the year, and to maintain the quality, the flowers are best picked first thing in the morning. Quality is key when growing such a precise crop, 
and the taste of the saffron depends on the rainfall, temperature and soil. Kashmir is famed for producing some of the highest quality saffron in the world. So, this is the Kashmir Wadi, which is the red soil, which is the same as the red soil. And this is the red soil, which is a Kudreti Tor, a fertilized land. So, we have to say that 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 we have to say and that small strand of saffron that you harvest as a result of all of this work? Well, to get the highest grades, you might need to throw half of it away. The most expensive, highest grade saffron is generally made up of just the very tips of the stigma. In Iran, wherever 90% of the world's saffron is produced, there are four grades. The lowest grade is the bunch. That's the entire strand that's pulled from the flower, from the dark red tips to the yellow base. In higher grades, the yellow strand is removed, leaving only a long strand of pure red. That means a kilo of saffron could be made up of 450,000 strands. And to get that many strands, you need 150,000 flowers. And those flowers take up a lot of growing space. Cumin, for example, can yield 600 kilos per acre. Nutmeg gets you around 350 kilograms in the same space. Use that land for saffron instead and you get a 1.8 kilogram harvest. Despite the incredible amount of work and space this crop takes up, demand for the spice is increasing, and over 200 metric tons of saffron threads are harvested worldwide each year. That's the result of about 30 billion flowers. Demand for the threads is so high that many adulterate or produce fake saffron. Threads that look real at first glance could actually be made of corn silks, coconut fibers, or even horsehair. Synthetic colorings are also used to dye the lower grade stigmas and sell them as high grade saffron. In late 2019, a fake saffron crime ring was uncovered in the UK, which led to a two year international investigation. And back in 2010, Spain exported 190,000 kilos of saffron, worth $50 million, but the country's total production amounted to only 1,500 kilos. At the time, a local farmers union reported that up to 90% of Spanish saffron exports were fraudulent. The industry has attempted to crack down on these fake and mislabeled products, but the problem still persists, and the market for fake saffron is closing many real saffron farmers down. So what does real saffron actually taste like? I've been asked that one by a lot of people over the years. It's, uh, it's so difficult to describe, which is, I think, part of its fascination for people and why it ended up, you know, as, a, as an expensive product, because it is, it just adds something. It's a bittersweet flavour, it's an earthy flavour. Trying to replicate it is very difficult. We've, we, you know, people have tried to do that, I know. While saffron is just as popular as ever, it's been sought after throughout history. In Greek mythology, Zeus sometimes slept on a bed of saffron and Cleopatra was said to bathe in saffron and milk, using the dyeing properties of the spice as an ancient fake tan. Every culture seems to have its own myth about the spice's powers, and in the 14th century, saffron's popularity skyrocketed across Europe when it was thought to be a possible cure for the plague. But there's a recent looming problem for saffron and its price, climate change. In Kashmir, production has dropped significantly, and many farmers are selling their land instead. We, we had, you know, very few uh, rains in the last, I think, four or five years. The temperature and the climate has completely changed in Kashmir. When I was a kid, when we used to go to the saffron farms to pick up the saffron, we would, it would at least take us two days to pick up the saffron from the same fields, which, you know, nowadays uh, you could just pick up in half an hour. I am I'm very emotional about the, the saffron because this is a cultural identity of Kashmir and especially the people of Pampur. But the thing is that, you know, the, the production is declining and uh, you know, the lands are being sold, the ha houses are being built on the saffron lands. You know, it really disheartens me. Between 2017 and 18, saffron production in the region fell almost 70%, from 16.5 metric tons down to 5.2. And with continuing droughts and climate change, this harvest could become even more rare. While some spices are dealing with drought, others are threatened by heavy and unpredictable rainfall. In the forests of South India, 
Harvesters climb trees as tall as 50 feet to handpick these clove buds. When exported, less than half a pound of these dried cloves costs $30. That's 10 times as much as some cumin. And while demand is growing, the clove industry in India is struggling to keep up. Cloves are the flower buds of clove trees that haven't blossomed yet. When dried, they're commonly used as a spice. A clove's flavor is complex, with notes of sweetness, bitterness, and heat. The oil found in cloves has medicinal properties that make the spice valuable outside of just cooking. Cloves with the round head or crown still intact have the most oil. But to get cloves with the highest possible oil content, highly skilled workers are needed at every stage. Clove is, uh, harvesting is a very big job. It's a very risky job. So we, we have to get uh, special people to do that. To get to the top of the trees, harvesters like Shibu rely on only a ladder and some rope. He reinforces the bottom of the ladder with mud so it doesn't move as he navigates the tall tree. Shibu ties a sack to his waist and then he starts his climb working his way from the top of the tree to the bottom. Harvesters can't pick too soon or too late, or the cloves will drop in grade and value. In addition to picking at the exact right time and being careful not to harm the clove bud, they need to be sure not to break the tree branches they climb. Otherwise, the tree will have a lower yield next harvesting season. Navigating all these elements can be extremely dangerous. In Black Rock Estates, harvesting cloves has led to death. A couple of years back, we lost a worker who was in the, while he was plucking the lightning strike him. We lost it. almost about six of them was, they had paralyzed like. They, we had to take them, rush them down to the hospital and they were admitted for a month. Yet handpicking is the only way farms like Black Rock Estate have managed to keep delivering quality cloves. Because timing is crucial, Charles needs a big team to pick the cloves as soon as they're ready, which is usually mid to late February. Charles can sell the cloves for their highest price in the first 25 days of the harvesting season. The more he can harvest during this time, the better it is for business. When the clove season is fully on, when we have a very good crop, we get about nearly about 300 workers. During peak harvesting season, these workers make around $30 a day on average. Once the clove clusters are picked, harvesters carefully remove the individual buds from the stalks and leaves. They sift and sort each bud according to its size, age, and whether it has a top. It's best if the circular crown of the clove, where it would otherwise flower, is still intact. This improves the spice's taste and aroma. Even though there are machines to help with this process, Charles prefers to pay for it to be done by hand to lower the risk of clove damage. They have clove breaking and uh, sorting with machinery, but still the, the half the clove is damaged in that. We get broken cloves in that. So it's not very good doing it with the machine. The highest quality cloves were picked at the right time, just before they turned pink or flowered. They're large and plump and still have the crown. Second quality cloves also still have their tops, but they're smaller. They were either picked too early or too late. And the third quality has no crown, with the top having either flowered or broken off. After the sorting, workers leave the cloves out to dry in the sun. High quality cloves take three days to dry under good sunlight but a quality clove won't always get sold as the highest grade because official grading doesn't happen until after it's dry. If there's too little or too much sun, the clove's quality drops. Instead of golden brown, it becomes black and it loses one of its most valuable properties, its oil content. First quality cloves are the most fragrant and have the highest oil content. The headless third quality cloves have the least and the difference shows in the price. Charles sells his first quality cloves for about $10 a kilogram, and its lowest grade for under $7.
clove oil is mostly made up of the compound eugenol, which is not only responsible for the clove's familiar aroma, but also for its medicinal benefits. Researchers have noted eugenol has antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, pain-relieving, and antioxidant properties. So the demand for cloves goes beyond their culinary uses. Cloves are so sought after in India that Charles is able to sell more than just the buds. We sell everything, nothing goes to waste. Even the pollen, the dust, everything we sell. That's also because the cloves he grows, Kanya Kumari cloves, are known for their high oil content and strong aroma. In fact, these cloves were awarded a GI indication in 2021. Charles says Kanya Kumari cloves are the most expensive variety in India. When you go to the market to buy cloves, the clove price will be about three times the price what we give. It'll be about 2,000 rupees, where we get only 750. The retail price is so much higher because of the supply chain. To maximize on profits for the farm, Charles won't sell his cloves directly to consumers, who only buy smaller amounts as needed. Instead, he sells to clove dealers who buy large quantities. Dealers like Franklin Roosevelt then have to keep the cloves fresh until they sell them to retailers. If he doesn't store the cloves properly, their shelf life drops. Glow ke liye ek temperature, us temperature mein log usko stock rakhte hain aur mostly cold storage mein hi jaake utarta hai. Matlab normal temperature mein rahega to maal bhi kharab ho jata hai aur uska taste flavor nahi rehta. To cover the cost of quality control, Franklin sells cloves to stores for almost $12 a kilo. The shops that buy from Franklin have to pay transportation and packaging costs, bringing the retail price of cloves in India even higher. But one of the biggest challenges in every step of the supply chain has been the changing climate. Because of the fungus fungus so, landlord is owners are also heavy loss. And those who invest in this, like my traders, they take a lot of labor from outside the village. So, they don't have a job for labor. We can't do so well as trading. Between 2018 and 2019, India lost 13 metric tons of cloves due to heavy rainfall. And while the global clove market is expected to grow by 3.5% by 2027, the changing climate may still continue to disproportionately burden clove farmers. No, now farmers are not seeing so much profit. Because I said that if it's going to be rain, it's going to be rain. And as much as they have invested, they don't have any return. If they come to the trading line, then it's okay. But they come to the trading line, because they don't have so much risk. If they take the risk, then they get money. It's not only plant species that are suffering from changes in the climate. Stone crabs, one of the priciest seafoods you can buy, are declining rapidly in population. Depending on their size, a pound of claws at a restaurant can cost as much as $70, and this has led harvesters to overfishing. Fishers can harvest only the claws from the crabs, while the bodies must be returned to the ocean. Though the crabs can regenerate these limbs, the claws need to be removed correctly and not prematurely, or the crabs can bleed to death. So what continues to make these claws so coveted? You can only fish for stone crab on the southeastern coast of the US, Cuba, the Bahamas, and Mexico. And it's Florida where more stone crabs are caught than anywhere else. These crustaceans are markedly more expensive than other popular crabs. A pound of claws can cost two times the price of Alaskan snow crab legs. Part of what makes these crabs so costly is the labor-intensive process of catching them. There's a nice crab. Ernie Patan Jr. has been commercially fishing for stone crabs for over 40 years. With limited time to harvest each year, his crew must start their days early, sailing out before the sun rises. The process begins with dropping traps down to the ocean floor. This is probably the funnest part, you know? You get to be a little more physical, you know what I mean? It's a little bit of a rhythm thing going on here. It's like a dancing mariachi. But plucking these claws can be a dangerous process. The claws on an adult crab can have as much as 9,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, 
with the enormous pressure that's exerted, they could actually pop a finger off at the joint. These crabs, they have a mind of their own. You can easily get bit, you know, if you're not careful. I've only been bit maybe, say, eight times in my career. Popped over a million claws in my day. The crew leaves the traps in the water for about two weeks before they're pulled in by a rope. Then each one must be sorted thoroughly. We come back in a couple of weeks and then got a couple in the trap. We're going to pull them out. We're going to pop their claws and uh, hope for a good day. Crews break off the claws quickly so they don't keep the crabs out of water for too long. But even if a trap is full of crabs, Kevin can't necessarily take every claw. The state requires all harvested claws to be at least two and seven eighths inches long. Crabbers can legally break off both claws if they meet the required size. The ones that look smaller, we measure them on the gauge, like that one. Crabs are one of few animals that can regenerate. When a crab loses a claw, or two, it can grow each one back in time. On average, claws can take up to three years to grow large enough to harvest again which is why the state requires that crabbers pay close attention to each claw's size. This ensures fishers don't remove one prematurely. But despite the claw's ability to regrow, some researchers have questioned the sustainability of this system. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission found that 46 to 82% of crabs died from the loss of two claws, while 23 to 59% died from the removal of one. That's compared to just 12.8% of crabs that died when no claws were removed. Crabs can also only regrow a claw if the joint that linked it is left intact, otherwise they'll bleed to death. This makes the way these claws are broken all the more important for preserving the fishery's future. Hiring enough people to make the operation run smoothly is another reason for the high price of these claws. And then there's one other cost you'd never expect. Each trip requires 900 pounds of pig's feet for bait. And that's just about half of the total cost of fishing for the day. Normal running cost to go stone crab in a day is about $1,100 to leave the dock. Bait prices have gone up, fuel prices have gone up, you know, the trap tag prices have gone up. After 10 hours on the boat, Ernie's crew must boil and ice their catch as soon as they return. Otherwise, the claws won't stay fresh. They finish the day by weighing each claw, which ultimately sets the final value. Claws are sold in four sizes. At Billy Stone Crab, restaurant prices range from $35 to $70 per pound. We run about 4,000 pounds of stone crab through the restaurant each week. On a busy weekend, we, we sell seven to 800 pounds of stone crab. The most expensive order costs $140. The plate is made up of four seven ounce colossal claws, which yields just under one pound of crab meat. Fresh cooked claws sold on ice are less expensive, but even then, the mediums will cost you $29 per pound. Years ago, stone crabs weren't such valuable food. In the 1890s, they were nothing more than bycatch in spiny lobster traps. Fishers began to keep the crabs that fell into those traps, and by the late 20th century, the stone crab fishery had become one of the most valuable industries in Florida. Today, it's worth $30 million, and the prices of these claws aren't likely to drop anytime soon. Data from the FWC show the number of crabs caught each year has declined by 712,000 pounds. That's since peak harvest in the late 1990s. Many commercial harvesters have also started fishing farther offshore, pointing to a lesser number of crabs in the area. The FWC says both of these changes signify a threat of overfishing, and prices have gone up in order to keep the fishery profitable. To further protect the species' future, the FWC instated even stricter regulations last year. Two changes include an increase in the minimum size of harvestable claws and cutting the fishing season short by two weeks. These limitations aren't likely to lower the cost of stone crab claws, but the goal is to help preserve them and keep Florida fishers busy for years to come. Another revered seafood being affected by a change in climate is the Copper River King Salmon. Often referred to as the Wagyu of salmon, it can cost up to $120 a pound. That is six times as much as other wild salmon and 10 times as much as farmed salmon. But king salmon are actually becoming smaller and smaller in size and huge king salmon are now very rare. 
With fewer fish available, the ones paying the price are the rural Alaskan communities who have depended on wild salmon as a leading food source for generations. King salmon, also called Chinook salmon, is one of the five species of wild Pacific salmon swimming through the Alaskan waters. The Copper River King is the largest and most nutritious of them all. The color of the Copper River salmon is just so vibrant. It's such a deep, deep red. And it's like one of those things when you see it, it's very obvious that that's a Copper River salmon. And it just tastes so buttery, it's amazing. Kyle and his crew set sail in the early hours of the morning from the Cordova Harbor. It will take them two hours to reach the delta of the Copper River. King salmon will stay in the Copper River delta for only three to six weeks. Kings are the first wild salmon of the season, and the start of the season is unpredictable. Although it roughly always falls around mid-May, fishers won't know it's time to set sail until less than a day before. We typically have such a short window to fish, it's really important for me to be able to make quick decisions. Go, go, go. The unpredictable outcome of each fishing run not only affects the price of each catch, but also builds up the excitement. We're, that's insane. That's insane. The location is the first challenge for Kyle and his crew. The delta of the river is very large, and not a lot of salmon swim in that area, so fishers like Kyle have to take their boats to shallow waters. It's extremely dangerous to fish for a Copper River King salmon because they like to hang out in shallow waters, and when you're fishing in that area, you're a lot more exposed to Mother Nature. You know, the waves are crushing, they're breaking on top of you, and you're a lot more susceptible uh, to capsizing your boat. Um, we're about to pick our anchor and then we're gonna uh, make a set. Once the anchor is set, the chances of catching anything are slim. King salmon makes up only a small percentage of the salmon in the Copper River. 90% is sockeye. That makes Kyle's job extremely difficult. Aside from that, local laws require he uses specific nets called gill nets. They're hung vertically to catch the fish by their gills. Gill netting is an extremely effective way to catch these fish because each net is hand built and completely customized. So, you know, for Copper River King salmon, we use a lot, a lot larger mesh size, around six inches. So the smaller fish swim right through it. And, you know, when we are able to locate a King salmon, they fit perfectly in our net. King, King. Give me a second, I'll, I'll explain in a second. Fuck. Should've pulled him over the fucking bow. Uh. So what had happened was, you know, so king salmon, they're, they're really large fish and they typically don't really get stuck into the net. They usually just wrap up. Um, so it's imperative that you have a dip net to catch them in case they pop out. And what had happened there was, it was the first king of the day. I was super, super excited. I had the net underneath and it had already peaked and started to crown over the bow roller. And I, uh, I tried to reach forward to pull it over, but because that it popped off and I was only holding the dip net with one hand and because the king was so large, it overpowered me and it ended up swimming out. But the same features that make gill nets such an effective way to catch king salmon are also what make using them so dangerous. There are a lot of hazards and dangers using a gill net, specifically on deck for the crew, just because we are using hydraulic equipment to send the net out into the water. There's a lot of loose mesh that goes flying out. So any you know, loose strings from a hoodie or shoelaces, all those are really prone to getting snagged. Missed catches are common here in the Copper River. Even after spending his whole day out on the boat, Kyle has a serious chance of coming back empty-handed. That makes the fish that he does catch even more prized. Oh, yeah, go, go. Oh, Woo. 
We just caught this toad of a Copper River King Salmon. This one probably weighs uh, probably 30, 35 pounds. Um, and for like retail price, we, you know, this goes is like $1,500, $2,000 right here. And um, just for a size comparison, this is uh, a Copper River Sockeye Salmon. Yeah, it's got a darker mouth. And then also on top of the spine, you'll see it's got spots along the line and also this nice silver um, with spots on the tail as well. So this one right here is probably 22 pounds gross. Um, it's a very beautiful, um, very fatty Copper River King Salmon. Um, very excited that we got the first, the first one on board. Uh, day's getting started and uh, looking forward to catching many more. The huge size of the Copper River King Salmon is due to its migration. Wild salmon are born in freshwater streams like the Copper River and then migrate to the ocean as juveniles. After spending most of their lives at sea, they return to their home to spawn. For the kings returning to the Copper River, this means enduring a 300 mile long journey against a 7 mile per hour current, swimming between glaciers and gaining 3,600 feet in elevation. Copper River salmon have the most intense salmon migratory route out of any salmon in the world. Because of that long journey home, it has a huge impact on the flavor of the Copper River salmon. Because the moment the salmon enter, you know, they go from the ocean, the seawater, and they hit that fresh water of the Copper River salmon, their body automatically changes into reproductive mode. So up until that day that they hit that fresh water, they're just feeding and building up fat to make that 300 mile long journey. Go, 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 go. Nice. 39,000 kings are set to return home to the Copper River this year, 13% below the 10 year average of 46,000. Out of these 39,000, fisheries are only permitted to catch less than half to ensure enough salmon make it up the river for future generations. Kyle is only allowed to go out once enough salmon have escaped the fishing ground and have started to make their way up the Copper River. The catch limit is different every day. It can be reached at any moment. And when it is, Kyle has to stop fishing and return to port immediately. But he still needs to bring home enough to keep his business running. And fishing in the Copper River bears high costs. If I came back empty handed, it would cost me, you know, it could be anywhere from $300 to $600 in fuel and probably a chunk of my pride. For a company like Kyle's, fuel can top $12,000 a season, but that's still significantly lower than the cost of a permit to commercially fish in these waters, which is $250,000. When I first started commercial fishing, I did not save any of my cash for myself just because I had taken on so much debt to buy into the fishery, I couldn't afford to save any of the salmon for myself. I eat salmon very regularly now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come in, come, come. Okay. Yeah, come, come. Oh! oh! <laughs> Go, 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 go. <laughs> oh my god, we got another one. That's six Oh my god. That's insane. Last of the day, we just brought in seven Copper River Kings. Insane. We're all, yeah. Dude, that was bonkers. Once Kyle returns to port, the fish must be filleted and packaged as soon as possible to preserve its nutritional value. It takes us about a week to get our salmon to consumers. The moment our fishermen return to port, we'll fillet, portion, vacuum pack, and flash freeze for a minimum of three days. So then that way the seafood is uh, consumable for sushi, it's considered sushi grade. They're so fatty, it's so oily, it's hard to hold on to them, they keep slipping. 
Kyle sells his king salmon to fine dining and sushi restaurants, but also directly to customers across the country. Shipping out of Alaska can get very expensive because of its remote location. It costs him $65 to ship a five pound box of salmon from Cordova to New York. Due to an increase in demand, the price of king salmon has slowly gone up over the last five years. A pound of Copper River King Salmon is now going for $100 to $120. Although bigger fish sell for more, huge King Salmon are getting harder to come by. A 2020 study found that in the last 60 years, salmon in Alaska have been getting smaller, especially kings. Since 1960, King Salmon have lost 8% in body length. Streams are warming earlier in the year, and salmon are making their migrations at a younger age and smaller size. There's also competition with other fish populations caused by hatcheries releasing the fish they produce into the sea. In the long term, this drop in size affects the salmon's commercial value, the transport of nutrients, egg production, and especially for king salmon, it reduces the supply for rural communities. Salmon and seafood in Alaska is more than just uh, like more than a job. It's very deeply rooted into our traditions. We have very many rural communities in Alaska that rely on these wild salmon runs as like their only source of protein. So, you know, they don't have, you know, some of them, they don't have access to grocery stores. So it's really important that we have these salmon runs return um, for them. Baby eels, also known as angulas, are also showing up on shores in smaller numbers they are a delicacy in Spain, where every year they're auctioned off for thousands of dollars. This kilogram of baby eels has just sold for over $7,000. But it is unclear if fishers will be able to support the rise in demand. The European eel is listed as critically endangered due to overfishing, habitat deterioration, and pollution. It's midnight in Riba de Seja, in the north of Spain, and it's the first day of the baby eel season. Esperemos pescar algo, algo. Mucho, mucho no, porque la, el tiempo no, no vino, no acompañó. Manolo has been fishing eels for the last 33 years. He's one of 46 fishers here in Riba de Seja who are licensed to fish angulas. Tonight marks the beginning of a four-month-long season. Cuando llega la temporada de, de, de la angula, yo me siento muy diferente. Eh, me siento con ansia, me siento nervioso, a pesar de que ya son unos cuantos años, pero todavía noto como como la primera. The fishing takes place at night when the eels are most active. Miramos los mejores momentos, los más propicios para para la pesca siempre es la la pleamar. The first thing Manolo does is assess the water. Right now, although awake, the eels are hiding in the sand, so he relies on the movement of the water to reveal them. Nosotros lo que bus lo que buscamos es más que nada el sitio donde las olas se juntan, porque trayendo la angula de un lado, trayendo la angula de otro, las deja siempre en esa zona. To fish, Manolo uses a custom rake called a ceazo. Entonces nosotros metemos el ceazo en en, en el agua y levantamos antes que venga la, la ola de, de atrás. Es el ceazo bien asentado en el suelo, porque si te queda colgando, la angula que te pasa por abajo no entra en el, en el ceazo. Manolo's timing needs to be spot on. If he lifts the rake one second later than he should, the same wave that pushed the eel into his net can also wash it back into the sea. Cayó, cayó. Estamos a la caza. Even with the right equipment, baby eel fishing has a serious risk of coming back empty-handed. That's because there is one thing Manolo can't predict, the weather. Nada, hoy es un, un día tranquilo, tranquilo, tranquilo. Normalmente esto es muy pocas veces. Lo que tiene que haber es Eh, temporal de mar, que haya mucho oleaje, que sean las olas grandes, que arrastre todo el fondo. Tonight is also a full moon. While it may give him some light on this dark beach, 
it's not ideal, as some eels may confuse it with daytime and stay buried in the sand. Lo que tenemos que buscar es cuanto más oscuro para la langula es mucho mejor. Pues eh, no no va bien la cosa. Bueno, se está acercando la hora, ¿eh? Vamos a cambiar de, de playa. Vamos a ir hasta la playa de San Antolín. This change of beach is a gamble for Manolo. There is no guarantee there will be eels there. That's because much is still unknown about their life cycle. The Angulus' journey starts very far away, in the Sargasso Sea, a region of the Atlantic Ocean close to the Caribbean. There, adult eels spawn and die, and their hatchlings travel through the Gulf Stream until they reach the coast of Spain, seeking fresh water. When they arrive, the Angulus are transparent. As they move out of the salty ocean and into rivers, the higher temperature of the fresh water will turn them from transparent to black as they mature into adult eels. Catching them before this transition occurs is essential. But the eel's exact journey is unknown, and it's impossible to predict the number of angulas that will arrive at the start of the season. Estos años de atrás vienen a hacerse pues unos 1500, 1700, aunque el año pasado disminuyó drásticamente hasta alcanzar unos 780 kilos aproximadamente. This unpredictability makes Manolo's job even more difficult. Pues con eso si sí cojo al final de la noche 50 gramos Ya son. Posiblemente sea el peor comienzo de, de, de hace mucho tiempo. Although the night is not going so well, the eels Manolo finds tonight will be the most expensive of the season. That's because buyers will pay a premium for the first night's catch. Mañana esperemos que tenga un buen precio. Ah, oh, mira, tenemos una. El récord me parece que eran sobre 5.000 euros y... Eh, mira, tres. Cuatro. Manolo caught 90 grams tonight. He doesn't know how much it will be worth yet. Before the eels are sold at the auction, workers at Riva de Seja Market clean them with a sponge to remove all the excess water that could affect their weight. 1.4 kilos arrived at the market today, the total catch of all fishers working last night. On a good day, the total catch can weigh 5 or 6 kilos. Today's low total will make this auction even more competitive. Bidders for the Angulas are typically restaurants in the area, and the lucky chef who will get to cook the eels is there in person to make the bid. Y cuando llega también la subasta y esa piquilla sana, esos nervios de a ver quién este año va a quedarse con la angula, también hay es emocionante. Manuel is the chef at El Campanú, a restaurant in Riva de Seja. He holds the record for the highest ever bid. His restaurant paid 6,620 euros per kilo in 2019. La subasta eh, del pescado se, se hace se hace a la, a la holandesa. Esto lo que quiere decir es que se pone un precio alto y, y va descendiendo. Desciende de 10 en 10. The auction itself is very quiet. It's done using a screen, and each buyer has a remote control that they use to make their bid. Y sabes quién va a ser el que va a pelear contigo. Aquí tienes que ser un poco lince a la hora de tocar el botón. Manuel made it. He gets to cook the first kilo of angulas of the season for 7,280 euros. That's a new record high. Yo me estaba fijando en la persona que iba y yo vi como hubo un movimiento ahí un poco extraño de esa persona hacia la puja y entonces calqué. Quedamos nosotros con la angula este año. Out of the whole batch, those 90 grams that Manolo fished last night were worth 655 euros today. 
Muy buen precio, muy buen precio, muy contento. La pena es que se pescó poco, claro, por eso el precio que, que tiene. Pero contento, contento, contento. Todo bien. But not all baby eels cost over 7,000 euros. Cost is variable depending on the time of year. That's why for fishers like Manolo, it's impossible to rely on just angula fishing for a living. El primer día, la subasta del primer día, económicamente para para mí no supone mucho. Lo lo importante son los tres meses y 29 días restantes. Eel fishing here in Riva de Sella is heavily regulated. Fishers like Manolo are only allowed to fish baby eels between November and February, with five mandatory rest days each month. Each fisher needs to hold a license, and certain beaches are no fishing zones. Breaking any of these rules can cost as much as 6,000 euros. These regulations mean that the price of angulas has skyrocketed in recent decades. When I started fishing with my father, I started to sell the angula, the most expensive, a 8.000, 10.000, 12.000 pesetas de la época. Y ahora en las últimas las últimas campañas eh, lo llegamos a vender hasta 810. Fue lo máximo que vendí. El kilo 810 euros. In the last 50 years, the demand for the increasingly scarce eels has risen so much that gulas, a cheaper copy of baby eels, were born. Gulas are made of surimi, the same fish paste used to make imitation crab and cost 62 times less than angulas. They are now just as popular as the real thing. This makes cooking with real baby eels a delicate task for chefs like Manuel. He needs to make sure the subtle taste of the angulas shines through and that they don't lose their texture, or they could be mistaken for their cheap imitation. Angulas can't be cooked alive because they'll release slime, so Manuel treats them with a tobacco infusion first. Y ahora ya estamos notando como la angula ya empieza a quedar tersa, a quedar más dura, va perdiendo la fuerza según va cogiendo la infusión de tabaco. He then removes the unwanted slime by hand. Por eso este proceso tiene que ser es el más costoso, el que más tiempo lleva y el más delicado de todos. Lo más importante de limpiar la angula es que pierda esa merma para que no deje ese mal sabor que deja esa cambia la textura y el sabor totalmente de la angula. Metemos agua hirviendo. Cuando ya empieza a quedar blanca, sacamos la angula y directamente la pasamos a frío para terminar para cortar la cocción. Esa textura que tiene la angula, una textura blanda, con, combinando el ajo y el picante, es una explosión de sabores en la boca. Despite the proliferation of gulas, in the last few years, real angulas have enjoyed increased popularity. The first day auctions generate a lot of buzz, with chefs arriving from all over Spain to make their bids. La demanda en este primer día de subasta ha, ha subido. Hay, hay muchos más compradores en estos últimos 10 años eh, y están dispuestos a pagar mucho más por ese primer por ese primer kilo de, de, de angula. Baby eels have become so popular that overfishing and smuggling are serious risks. In 2017, Spanish police uncovered an international trafficking operation headed for China, which included 2 million euros worth of angulas. But it's unclear if the seasons to come will be able to support this rise in demand. The European eel is listed as critically endangered, and fewer and fewer baby eels arrive at the beaches of Riva de Seja each year. Llevo hacia 33 años. Eh, que no perdí, no perdí, no perdí ninguno. Y sí, sí es cierto que si miras a los años de, de atrás, de 10, de 15, de 20 años, las capturas, las capturas bajaron, bajaron, bajaron. Eh, también bajaron los, los pescadores. There are different theories for this decline, including climate change, habitat deterioration, 
pollution and overfishing. But for Manolo, fishing angulas is not about money. Pues la verdad que a mí la, la pesca de la angula me encanta. Eh, son muchos años y, y ya desde cuando, desde pequeñín, que iba con mi padre, con, con, 13, con 13 añinos, 12 añinos, eh, ya, ya empecé a, a disfrutar porque me gustaba la pesca. A ver, yo me encanta estar aquí. A long-loved food in South America is royal quinoa, which in recent years has become a pricey global superfood, with black royal quinoa going for $8,000 per metric ton in 2011. The price has, at times, climbed so high that many locals could no longer afford to eat it. The high demand for this premium quinoa has led to over-farming and has drained the soil of its nutrients. Unpredictable weather and droughts have also limited harvests. While different varieties of quinoa now grow all over the world, royal quinoa only grows in southern Bolivia, near the Salar de Uyuni salt desert. It grows larger than other quinoas, and it's considered to be even more nutritious. It's the only plant that can produce in these zones. It's something magical here. Here, at 3,600 meters above sea level, farmers still use traditional methods to harvest quinoa. Bolivia's mountainous terrain means it's difficult to modernize production. But the farmers also follow tradition to honor the earth and their ancestors. Algunas familias ancestralmente lo hacían en el arrancado de la quinoa, pero viendo el requerimiento de los mercados que están exigiendo, ahora hacemos el uso del os. La parte más difícil siempre es la cosecha, porque se requiere bastante, bastante personal. El, los primeros días, en todo caso, ahí, ahí siempre se siente el, el resentimiento del cuerpo, porque no es, eh, no es una actividad cotidiana del día, es una vez al año. Y posteriormente, al segundo o tercer día, ya el cuerpo mismo se va habituando a la actividad. The farmers drive over the quinoa with tractors to thresh it or to separate the grains from the stems. Because of the high altitude, everything is done early in the morning to avoid the humidity. After the threshing, the quinoa is taken to be sifted, which removes any remaining stems. This usually takes place in the afternoon and depends on wind conditions. The quinoa needs to have all its saponin removed as well. Saponin is a bitter tasting chemical that protects the outer shell of quinoa seeds from pests and disease. Royal quinoa also has a lot more saponin than other quinoa varieties, which is what allows it to grow in such extreme conditions. It also means cleaning the quinoa for consumption is a lot more time consuming. The saponin has to be either thoroughly washed off or removed via special machines that won't damage the grains. And then it's time for the grains to be separated for processing. While some of this is done by machine, many parts can still only be done by hand. This intense process drives up labor costs. Esta inspección en el laboratorio de control de procesos es a mano. No, no, hasta ahora no se ha no se ha inventado ninguna máquina que pueda separar este tipo de impurezas como la paja, como el cuarzo, como la piedra. Por eso tenemos que hacer un uso intensivo de de, de la vista y de la mano, ¿no? Por eso es, es muy costoso, pero nosotros aseguramos así que la quinoa real sea la mejor en el mundo. En Hachainti recibimos aproximadamente entre 30 a 40 lotes mensuales, los cuales son procesados en esta planta. Estamos hablando de aproximadamente unos mil toneladas eh, al mes. Because royal quinoa production happens on a relatively small scale, when global demand for quinoa first started ramping up in 2006, prices skyrocketed. In just five years, royal quinoa tripled in price on the international market, hitting $3,200 per metric ton. The colored varieties of royal quinoa are even more expensive. Red royal quinoa has sold for around $4,500 a metric ton, and black royal quinoa nearly twice that. The UN even declared 2013 the year of quinoa to celebrate its health benefits and growing popularity, which only increased worldwide demand for it. Many Bolivians moved back to their rural hometowns to grow quinoa to take advantage of the profitable crop. In just six years, 
Bolivia's quinoa fields more than doubled in size, and many farmers stopped following the traditional method of allowing the land to rest every other year. The profits from royal quinoa were life-changing. People were able to build new houses and send their kids to school. Quinoa's hefty price tag, however, meant some Bolivians could no longer afford to eat it. But why was quinoa selling for so much? Well, in recent years, there's been widespread global demand for healthier food. And there's no healthier food than quinoa. UNESCO even named it the perfect food for humanity because it's gluten-free and has all nine essential amino acids. NASA's astronauts eat quinoa during long space missions because the gluten-free grain is so packed with fiber, protein, and vitamins. And is a great substitute for animal meat. Quinoa also contains phytoestrogens, which are thought to help prevent cancer and other diseases. And since royal quinoa is one of the largest varieties, it's considered to be even more nutritious. So Bolivia's royal quinoa crops were extremely valuable. But the international demand for quinoa and unprecedented profits that came with it have spelled disaster for Bolivia's share of the quinoa market. The rush to produce more quinoa has caused severe soil erosion and infertility. Podemos ver los efectos de ese trabajo intensivo de producción quinoa real que ya no producen nada. O salen algunas plantas, pero han quedado improductivas. Many farmers have been focusing on quinoa instead of rotating it with other crops or livestock, which has drained the soil of nutrients. And with fewer farmers raising llamas, there's less manure to fertilize the land. Recent droughts and storms have also damaged Bolivia's royal quinoa crops. El año pasado la cosecha ya fue mermada por principalmente la sequía. Fue un mal año. Este año tuvimos un, el fenómeno de la niña. Inicialmente una sequía donde necesitaba la planta poder desarrollarse en sus primeras etapas. Posteriormente se presentó lluvias permanentes. No permitieron que la quinoa pueda desarrollar naturalmente porque la quinoa no requiere de mucha agua. So production is down and the quinoa plants themselves are much smaller than usual. And despite the high demands and low supply, prices have been falling. Lo que pasa es que si bien hubo muy baja producción, la expectativa del productor es que los precios puedan subir. Pero no ocurre eso porque el mercado no lo manejamos. Ahora el mercado tiene mucha quinoa, entonces van a tener que alinearse a los precios competitivos que se tienen. Other countries growing quinoa have more modern technology than Bolivia, so their crops haven't been as affected by weather conditions. Peru has taken Bolivia's spot as the world's top producer of quinoa, and even though Peru does not grow royal quinoa, and in fact, no other country in the world can, most consumers aren't aware of the difference. The price of royal quinoa has dropped from $294 per 100 kilograms to just $83. Bolivia went from exporting 30,000 metric tons of quinoa in 2014 for $200 million to 33,000 metric tons for $81 million in 2018. Farmers are operating at a loss, and they're unable to invest in the equipment they would need to modernize. The fall in quinoa prices, however, has reintroduced quinoa into many Bolivians' diets. En la caída, ahora vemos que el consumo ha mejorado de la quinoa. Los precios ya son accesibles, inclusive para la población de la ciudad. No como esas veces era tan caro que era muy difícil acceder a comprarse quinoa. Hay un efecto interesante en que muchos municipios, el subsidio alimenticio, lactancia materna, está siendo eh, utilizada la quinoa como base de la alimentación. Eso es bien importante, pero falta. La, el consumo de quinoa todavía en Bolivia es bajo. Bolivia is also looking to rebuild a market for its royal quinoa. After all, the global quinoa market is valued at around $90 billion, and it's expected to grow to nearly $150 billion by 2026. In 2020, Bolivia's royal quinoa industry successfully obtained a protected designation of origin. This will help brand royal quinoa as a high-quality product you can only get from Bolivia, similar to Spain's Iberico ham or Italy's San Marzano tomatoes. Ideally, this will improve royal quinoa sales on the international market and allow producers to raise their prices, which will, in turn, 
allow farmers to modernize their methods while staying sustainable. Bueno, contra, lo, contra el clima es muy difícil poder hacer alguna acción, pero sí podemos mejorar lo que la parte biológica, la producción. Podemos incidir en que estas pérdidas no sean como las que se está viendo, sino que sean menores, mejorando la fertilidad, reponiendo la vida del suelo y que sean más productivas. Eso podríamos y estamos haciéndolo. ¿no?